Yes, and I'm sort of happy that I'm talking after Roe because uh, one of the studies that I'll be discussing today is also on Twitter and around political protests um, in the Spanish context, and I'll say a bit more about that later. So I'm going to use my presentation to give a brief overview of uh, what, in my opinion, are the main challenges um, that we social scientists encounter when trying to make sense of digital data, uh, challenges that I think we should all be thinking about to try to make the best um, out of this sort of data. As instructed, I'm going to focus on methodological issues rather than the substantive or the theoretical implications of the research, um, which I think are um, also very important, obviously, particularly in this era of data deluge when it's easy to draw in information and not know really what to do with it. But uh, I'm going to leave that discussion for another occasion. So I'm going to start my presentation by pointing at one of the big questions of social science research, which is how you can go from the individual to the collective. Uh, or how uh, individual actions and motivations aggregate in the form of collective patterns of behavior. And this question has been very difficult to tackle so far because of a lack of appropriate data um, and, and the complexity of the connection between the individual and the collective. And this is precisely what digital trails are allowing us to understand better. And what you have on the screen is Schelling's classic model of racial segregation. With this model, he aimed to show two things. First, that aggregated patterns often arise as an unintended consequence of individual behavior. And second, that small differences at the individual level can make big differences at the aggregated level. And what this all means is that if we were to take a snapshot of the aggregated patterns, we would probably draw the wrong conclusions about the underlying mechanisms. And Again, as I said, part of the reason why it has been so difficult to explore empirically this connection uh, and the unintended consequences that arise from it is because of lack of appropriate empirical data, particularly around the structure of interdependence that links individual actions. Um, and this is what digital data is changing, because now we have access to that sort of information. Now, researchers pioneering the use of online data have been talking about the emergence of a new social science for a few years now, and their message is that online data can revolutionize our understanding of social behavior, not only because of its higher quality and higher resolution, transactional data is all about what people do in real time as opposed to what they claim to be doing, um, and also because it encourages collaboration across disciplinary boundaries, which can only enrich traditional research questions and research designs. Um, obviously, using this data uh, presents some challenges, and I'm going to focus on two, how to deal with the time dimension and with the scale of this data. Um, and they are issues to the extent that they are new for sociologists and, and social scientists uh, in general, who are uh, used to working with smaller data sets, cross-sectional data or panel data measured months, if not years, um, apart. And now suddenly we have access to data sets that can easily scale up to tens uh, of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands or even millions. And, and also, you know, the data, the time resolution of which can go down to the second. The question is, how do you slice that data and aggregate it in time so that we can analyze relevant trends? And um, you know, I don't have a solution or a definite answer to this question, but I'm going to explore why the answer uh, to this question is relevant using three examples drawn from my own research. And again, I'm, gonna focus, I'm not going to focus on the substantive question that we try to answer or theories that we were trying to test with this research. I'm going to focus on the methodological choices that were made when analyzing the data and the implications uh, of those choices. The first example is work that I'm doing in collaboration with George Paltoglo from Wolverhampton University, who's also part of uh, Mike's team. Um, and in this work, we track the full lifespan of an online community devoted to the discussion of political news and current affairs. It was a news discussion forum hosted by the BBC in one of its websites. The forum opened in June of 2005 and closed in September of 2009. And what we do is to track all the activity that took place during this period. This is not a particularly large data set. I think overall there's just about 10,000 unique users uh, involved in the whole period, but we can track interactions between these users as they took place. And so what we did was to reconstruct interactions as networks of communication following the structure and, and the logic of, of threaded conversation. So for instance, here we have user A sending a message, then user B replies to that message, and he in turn gets a reply from user C who gets a reply back from user A. And from that exchange, we can reconstruct a directed network like the one that you see on the screen. But obviously, time is an important dimension in this reconstruction. And so if we split this exchange in two time windows, then the resultant networks will change. 
Um, and these time windows can correspond to days, weeks, months, years. And which one is the most relevant unit of analysis is, is not clear, or is, there's no strong intuition as to why we should, uh, a priori, we should use one aggregation window versus another. But obviously this choice matters because the measures that we can then take on, on these networks on the aggregate level will be affected by that choice. So for instance, here we have the evolution of some network statistics over the four year period that we consider using monthly aggregations. So we take into account all interactions that took place within calendar months. Now, these numbers would probably look very different. In some instances, they do look very different um, had we used a different uh, time aggregation. And there is already some work published that assesses how network metrics change when we use different widths for these time windows, but we still don't have systematic knowledge on how transforming continuous data into discrete aggregations affects our measurements and so the conclusions that we can draw uh, from those measurements. So, second example refers to work that I have done with colleagues based in Barcelona and Singapore. And what we try to do in this research is infer public opinion indicators uh, from online communication. The method we apply is based on some psychological research. What we do is extract the emotional tone of discussions in three dimensions, violence, arousal, and dominance. And again, the question is, what is the natural width uh, for our observation windows? Should we aggregate these emotional scores weekly, monthly, yearly, and what's the difference of, of doing so? And so, in this case, again, we opted for month aggregations. What you see here is the score for two uh, of the emotional dimensions, valence, which is a happy and happy scale, and arousal, which is a measure of excitement. And you know, to the extent that in, in this particular research, we wanted to correlate these measures with presidential approval rates as a way of testing the robustness of the measurements and sort of their validity to explain something real. Um, but again, the remaining there's the remaining question of finding the right time resolution. Um, you know, as opposed to the one that, that we have been using so far because this is, in a way, imposed by the way in which polls and surveys, opinion polls in this case, and surveys have traditionally been conducted. Third example. This is joint work with colleagues in Spain, um, Javier Borges and Yamir Moreno. As I mentioned before, what we do here is look at Twitter activity around the protests that took place uh, in May last year in Spain, the Indignados or the Outrage Movement which acted as an antecedent uh, of the Occupy campaign that went global towards the end of the year. Um, here we're working, it's a slightly smaller uh, data set than the one Rob works with. We're working with half a million tweets sent by around 88,000 users. And one of the questions that we try to answer in this research is what explains this aggregated diffusion curve of activated users? So what we do here is track the proportion of users that had sent at least one protest message, which we take as an indication of them being active participants in these mobilizations. And as you can see, there is an exponential growth in the week following May 15, which was the first big demonstration. Um, Day. So we want to understand what individual level mechanisms underlie this diffusion pattern. And what we do is to approach these individual level mechanisms uh, um, by trying to infer the threshold distribution from the data. Threshold models are um, sort of one of the classic models in so uh, social science research, and, and they try to understand what makes people do things in terms of social influence. So if a lot of people around me uh, buys a product or joins a political protest, then I am more likely to join that protest myself. And what thresholds do is try to assess this intrinsic propensity that I have to do something. So when threshold is closer to zero, that means that I'm sort of a leader, that I will be doing something even if nobody around me is doing that thing. When the threshold approximates one, that means that I need a lot of local pressure in order to do something. What you have on the screen is two schematic examples of how threshold activation works. In this case, we have two focal users with different networks. The user to the left gets activated when two of the uh, uh, neighbors had already sent messages. The user to the right gets activated when four neighbors were already active. And so in this case, we have two users with the same, same thresholds, 0.5, which means that approximately half of my neighbors need to do something for me to do uh, that same thing. But they, uh, they are embedded in different local networks, which means that even when they have the same intrinsic propensity to do something, they will be activated at different points in time just because they inhabit different local contexts and they are exposed to different um, information. And this is what the box plots to the right indicate. On the horizontal axis, we have the range of thresholds from zero to one. On the vertical axis, we have the chronological day of activation. That was the day when they, uh, they, they sent their, their first protest message. And as you can see here, there is quite a lot of variance, particularly for small thresholds, um, for people who were the leaders um, of this um, chain reaction. 
Um, and the reason why you know, variance is, is bigger for them is because they're likely to get activated for reasons that have nothing to do with the network that we are measuring uh, you know, the, the, for exogenous reasons. Um, um, but in any case, what this trend indicates is that the higher the threshold, the longer it took on average for users to get activated. And I should mention that most threshold models assume a normal distribution or some sort of distribution in the population. It has barely ever been measured empirically just because it is very difficult to get that sort of data. And in a way, our contribution with this research is try to infer that threshold distribution from the data itself. And the threshold distribution, by the way, doesn't follow uh, the normality assumption that most models um, assume. Another thing we consider in this research is the size of information cascades, which is somehow related to what we talked about, retweeting. We didn't have access to retweet information, so we had to reconstruct information cascades in a slightly different fashion. Our assumption here is that protest activity is contagious if it takes place within short time windows. And again, the question is, how do you determine how short that time window is? Um, and because we have timestamps for every message that was sent, we can follow activity through the network as a time series. In this case, for instance, we have user one uh, emitting a message at time t. All his followers, we assume that all his followers potentially read the message. They all receive the message. Some of them read it. Um, one of these followers, user two, decides to emit a protest message at time t plus delta t. And the relevant thing here is the parameter delta, which we tune in order to uh, make that time gap wider or narrower. And so we assume that a second set of users, those following user two, are included in the cascade. And finally, we have a third node, user three, who joins the spreading of information by sending another message at time t plus two delta t. Um, um, and so the final size of the cascade is the number of nodes of your users that are exposed to the information diffused during this short time window over the total number of users directly connected to these um, spreaders. The question is, so do we get uh, different findings when we change the value of these parameter delta? So when we play around how wide or how narrow those observation time windows are? Um, this is the distribution of cascade sizes for different values of delta, one hour, two hours, four hours. What it shows in general is that only very few cascades percolate to affect most users. So. Um, triggering global information cascades, even in the context of an exceptional event like this mass mobilization, is very rare. Um, and what the three different curves indicate is that these results are robust using different time intervals, so you know, using different values of delta, which uh, uh, give us confidence that these results are not due to some operationalization, that they are really signaling something. So that was my last example. Um, I hope that these three examples give an overview of the kind of issues that we encounter when analyzing online data. There's many more other issues, but hopefully we can discuss some other things in other sessions. Um, and so just to summarize, there are three questions that in my opinion are particularly relevant and that we really need to work hard to answer properly. The first question is, what is the right time window to aggregate online data? And I think we need more research uh, to um, on how to appropriately model continuous data, especially network data, which is again increasingly being available thanks to all these digital um, um, uh, transactional uh, data sets, uh, reconstructing interpersonal communication networks in the pre-internet era was very time consuming, very difficult, and it was super difficult to get longitudinal network data. Now it is relatively easy, but we have to um, build better models in order to make sense of that um, uh, of that continuous data. Second question is, how do different network structures co-evolve? And this refers uh, to the fact that social networks are multiplex in nature, meaning all of us belong to different networks at the same time. We are in Twitter, but we're also in Facebook and LinkedIn. We are part of professional associations. We are part of networks like these. Uh, we belong to sports clubs and many other offline networks. And all these uh, uh, networks are interacting all the time. And if we only focus on one level, we're surely missing the feedback effects that come from the other levels. Now, in the Twitter example I mentioned, um, you know, we only track part of, the, part of the activity that was taking place. We can only assess um, activity around the protest as it took place in Twitter. But obviously, all these people were on the streets protesting. So there were lots of other communication networks um, having an influence on people's behavior at the same time. And so if we only focus on one of these levels, we are surely missing a lot of information. And uh, there's a lot of very clever people working on how to best model these multiplex networks, uh, but I think we need to work harder again um, uh, to, to come up with better models. 
and the availability of digital data and the fact that we are living ubiquitous trails every time we are online, so it's helping us uh, build those models. The third question is how important is social influence compared to self-selection? And uh, better data means that we can follow contagion and diffusion dynamics with higher resolution, uh, but online data often lacks demographic information that is essential to control for self-selection uh, or homophily effects. Again, in the Twitter example, we assume that when people got activated and started sending messages, they were somehow being influenced by the people around them. But maybe all those people are connected in Twitter because they share a number of attributes, because they are similar in a number of respects. And you know, it is uh, those attributes that make them be more likely to be active politically, not necessarily the fact that they see what each other are doing. And so we need to um, find ways of controlling for that homophily um, and again, you know, while it is true that digital data often lacks that sort of demographic information, it is also true that uh, um, digital technologies are, are allowing researchers to scale up the size of experimental and control of experiments and control groups. And this is the perfect research design. Sort of experiments are the perfect research design to disentangle the effects of social influence um, and homophily. And finally, there's the obvious question. Um, of you know, the, the obvious fact that the abundance of, of data does not make good theoretical motivations less necessary. Theory is still very important. It is theory that can help us discriminate the signal from the mere noise. And um, so we shouldn't forget that even though we have a lot of uh, amazing data, we should still pose the right questions to that data uh, if we want to get interesting answers. And I'm going to leave it here. repeat. Um, thank you, that was really fantastic. Um, you highlight the kind of the context within which some of this communication is taking place and that some of it is online and some of it is the people actually in the street with their mobile devices tweeting and so on. So um, I didn't get from your presentation whether you're also looking at what's happening outside the online space or is it something that you simply flag up as we must look at that? Are you also looking at that? Um, we don't, um, although obviously we acknowledge the fact that these are not endogenous, completely closed systems. We assume that dynamics are endogenous because we can do, I mean, that's, we are forced to assume that. Um, it is very difficult, I mean, it would be great if we could, if we could track what these people were doing mm -hmm. at the, sort of offline at the same time that they were Twittering. Um, that's not possible, and even if it were possible, I'm not sure we would be, be allowed to do it for privacy reasons and lots of other good reasons. And so, you know, that's, that's a challenge. and and. We are in a better position to understand certain dynamics like diffusion just because we have better data, but that doesn't solve all the, all the problems. And, um, and as I said, it's not only that we cannot track what happens offline, but also we cannot track what happens in all the other networks in which people are embedded at the same time. And all these things make an, uh, make a, uh, you know, ha have an impact on the kind of processes that we analyze. But I think that at least we are trying, we are getting better at exploring this connection between what yeah, happens on the individual sure. level and sort of the aggregated patterns. Mm -hmm. and, it's a small step, but I think, we can I think it's a big step, but it's much more than a small step. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Hi, I'm Pablo Mateos from UCL. I mean, I was interested in your first example, uh, an internet discussion forum. I wonder whether you actually explore the content of those. Uh, messages rather than just the structure and uh, how difficult is it to actually get uh, some more semantic meaning from the internet discussion forums as opposed to the Twitter which is more uh, shorter, easy to control. We do look at the content and we actually apply a measure of sentiment similar to what Rob talked about um, so we can evaluate whether the messages contributed to the forum are positive or negative or neutral. Um, oh, sorry, can you hear me? Oh. And so we do look at the content in the narrow sense that we measure the sentiment as positive, negative, or neutral. And so we have measures over time about how positive or negative overall messages in this forum were. And the, one of the reasons why we look at that is because if you look at the, I didn't show that, but if, if you look at aggregated patterns, uh, sort of uh, uh, aggregated levels of activity, uh, this community has a phase of growth, but then after, you know, after a few months 
of being active, the activity starts to decline. One of the things we want to understand is, is that related to the actual uh, dynamics of the discussions you know, and, and the emotional content of the discussion is one of the, the factors that we take into account. So we try to understand whether changes in the sentiment of the messages contributed to the forum uh, um, are related to the decline of the community. Um, but again, I mean, we, we submitted this paper for review. It hasn't been published yet. Um, and reviewers are very reluctant to accept that that measure of sentiment um, is informative enough to understand. If you talk to psychologists, they find it very narrow, sort of, they find it a horrible measure. They, they can, well, at least Mike maybe can tell us something else because, you know, he probably has more experience, but um, they're not convinced that it actually measures the actual uh, emotional load of, of those discussions. Um, it's a start, and we find interesting correlations, but uh, we have to work uh, at devising better tools for extracting meaning from uh, written communication. And you know, all these algorithms, machine learning algorithms, they can get very complicated. I mean, one of the first questions you have to answer is what, what's the unit of analysis? Are we assessing words, sentences, uh, entire paragraphs? And what do you do with irony? And what do you do? So, you know, human communication is very complex. Machines are silly. They are very clever at certain things, but they are very silly at others. And so we still haven't managed to devise the algorithms that can capture all the nuances of human uh, communication. But we are getting better, I guess. <laughs> Um, okay, so we looked at quantitative methods. Um, clearly, people are making strides, but clearly there's equally a long way to go, if not further. Um, 